Sachsenhausen, nestled into the southern shore of the main river in Frankfurt, Germany, dated back to the 13th century and was famous for pubs known as cider houses, because just outside the city of Frankfurt grew apples in vast orchards. Gertrude Margaret Siepmann was born in Sachsenhausen on October 14, 1933, the first child of Hans and Riel, short for Maria or Little Marie, Siepmann. Hans's father Franz had been in the German Navy in the Great War and rose to the rank of chief engineer of the light cruiser Kohn, the Admiral's flagship. In the first naval engagement of the war at Heligoland Bight, Chief Engineer Siepmann assumed command of the Kohn after both the Admiral and the ship's captain were killed in combat. Franz went down with the ship and suddenly nine-year-old Hans Siepmann was orphaned. Gertrude spent her early years in a resurgent Germany with falling unemployment and a strengthening mark. People had purpose, and the purpose was rebuilding a will, rebuilding a country that had been crushed by defeat in the Great War and then by depression. In the summer of 1936, before Gertrude had turned three, the Siepmanns moved from an apartment in Sachsenhausen to another in Wilhelmshaven so that Hans could begin his new job as a naval engineer at Germany's only deepwater port. Hans, her puppy, took Gertrude to work one day, and she got to explore a strange all-enclosed ship at the dock that looked like a long gray pipe with a little house on top. This was Poppy's project, something called an Unterseeboot, or U-boat, and everyone was so nice to her, treating her like a smart little girl. She marveled at how compact everything was in the U-boat, including the tiny kombuza, a kitchen that seemed about the size of something her dolls would use. The cook carefully explained to Gertrude how he served a ship full of hungry sailors from that little room. Wilhelmshaven was another old city and a lively place with the vibrancy of many cultures coming together. Denmark sat not too far north, and England lay across the North Sea to the west. The Zietmann's home sat on the ground floor of an apartment complex with a courtyard at center. Gertrude would visit an old man named Rosenzweig, who lived in a small house next to the apartment building. Herr Rosenzweig grew beautiful flowers. He seemed very old to Gertrude, with a long white beard, worn face, and simple long black coat. He moved about slowly and always wore a small cap on the crown of his head. Sometimes he would cut flowers from his garden and present them to her with a gentle smile. These were thrilling times for children in Germany, with so much excitement and color and pageantry. They would be told of a parade, and people would line the streets. Then bands marched past in uniforms, playing grand tunes with lots of brass and drums that seemed to go straight through Gertrude. Soldiers went by carrying guns strapped to their shoulders, their black boots striking the cobblestones all at once so the ground shook. At the head of each column of soldiers was a man carrying a Schellenbaum, a silver staff adorned with a gleaming eagle, its wings spread on top with a red, white, and black flag underneath. The Schellenbaum would pound the street in rhythm to the music, and bells on the crossbar of the staff rang in unison. Gertrude watched the people cheer, wave, and applaud as the soldiers moved on by. Gertrude Siepmann began grade school in a two-story brick schoolhouse in Wilhelmshaven. Every morning her class stood facing a larger-than-life-sized portrait of the Führer to recite a pledge of a right arm of each child pointed out stiffly in salute. Gertrude's reading books featured stories about the Führer and about what it took to be a good German. Gertrude was living a happy childhood, but there were exceptions. One November morning in 1938, Riel bundled her daughter up for a trip and said something puzzling. You are going to see history today. They took a tram downtown, where they saw buildings called synagogues that lay in smoking ruins. 
Entire blocks of storefronts had their windows smashed so that shards of glass covered the pavement. It was hard to walk, said Gertrude. My feet slipped on the glass, and the smoke stung my eyes and burned my throat. Terrible things had just happened there. Gertrude's horrified question of her mother was an obvious one, even to a small child. Why? One day, not long after Crystal knocked, the night of broken glass, Gertrude went to visit her neighbor, Herr Rosenzweig. But he wasn't in his garden and failed to answer the door when she rang the bell. She asked around about the kindly man with the long beard and was told, he's been taken away to a labor camp where he won't be able to do any more harm. Herr Rosenzweig taken away? He had occupied a warm place in Gertrude's heart. And now that spot darkened with worry. How could he hurt anyone by growing flowers? At the beginning of spring, 1939, came amazing news. The Führer, Adolf Hitler, was going to visit Wilhelmshaven to launch the battleship Tirpitz. He arrived April 1st, the weather beautiful, and great crowds, including the Zeepmans, greeted him. Red banners with swastikas waved in the stiff sea breeze. Then Gertrude saw the Führer in a long green coat adorned with medals. His face was happy as he chatted with other soldiers, before standing up at a microphone to speak. His words full of pride for Wilhelmshaven. Slowly, the Führer's voice changed until he shouted and waved his fists in the air, because England was doing awful things to Germany. In a little while, Gertrude began to cry. Everyone loved this man, but seeing him in person filled Gertrude with fear and confusion. War came when Germany went off to teach those Tommies a lesson. News reports told of the invasion of England's ally, Poland, and then about the Battle of Britain. Late one night, a siren wailed. Hans and Riel hurried the family downstairs to their storage room in the basement. Many families trooped down the stairway in just such a fashion, their faces painted in worry, each to their own storage room. A low drone and a vibration signaled planes approaching overhead. Anti-aircraft cannons fired, and distant crackles echoed. In a little while came rumbles like thunder. Soon the roar was constant and frightening. Then it was over. The siren sounded once more, and they returned to their apartment. Out the windows they could see the orange glow of fires burning in the distance that alarmed Poppy as he sent the children back to bed. Not to sleep exactly, but to bed. Early in 1941, Hans announced the family must leave and go somewhere safe. All packed their suitcases, and he took them to the Bonhof and kissed his wife and his four children goodbye and placed them on the train. It was the end of Gertrude's lovely childhood in a home with two parents and three siblings. That day in winter 1941, as the string of passenger cars pulled out of the station in Wilhelmshaven. The Dungeon of Epstein. Riel Zipmann remained in the farmlands of central Germany with her children for two years, until she couldn't stand it any longer. Then she packed everyone up and headed for one of her favorite places in Germany, the Altstadt, or Old Town of Frankfurt. The Old Town was built around the triple facade, five-story medieval Romer, the Frankfurt City Hall that stood across the square from Old St. Nicholas Lutheran Church. The people of Frankfurt gravitated here for all their celebrations, particularly the annual Christkindlmarkt, with dozens of vendors setting up shops around the beginning of December to offer traditional German bratwurst, pretzels, and beer, all in celebration of the Christ Child and the most magical season of all. The new home of the Zipmann family was in Epstein, which sat nestled in rugged hills northwest of Frankfurt, 30 minutes by train. This old world German town had received its charter in 1318. And here the Zipmans settled into a plain but sturdy three-story half-timbered house shared with another family. Epstein proved a godsend. The three older children had their own mountain to explore and a stream to play in. 
The most fascinating spot in town was Kassel Epstein, an elaborate crumbling bastion begun in the 10th century AD and built into a high knoll in the heart of town. Its stout tower rose 25 meters from the structures below and dated from the middle of the 14th century. Gertrude and her siblings explored what parts of the giant structure they could, although they had been forbidden to do so. Who could resist visiting the open-air dungeon with rusting shackles still hanging from ancient walls? Gertrude passed her tenth year experiencing the sights and sounds of skies full of big enemy planes, moving overhead at high altitude, from west to east, hundreds of planes at a time. So many planes, each leaving a vapor trail, that after they had passed, a sunny day suddenly became overcast. The vibration of the planes shook the earth. A little while later, she would hear explosions off in the distance, in the direction of Frankfurt. Steady rumbling for minutes and minutes. Sometimes it felt like it would never end, and she could only imagine what was going on there. But she didn't want to imagine it because she had lived it in Wilhelmshaven. She knew those people over the hill in Frankfurt. They were her friends, her family. Gertrude was playing outside on a Saturday morning, the last Saturday in January, 1944, when the enemy planes flew over again. It was a large formation, and it seemed to be heading, as before, for Frankfurt. She tried to continue playing, but her heart felt heavy. Gertrude's uncle Julius, Muti's brother, and his wife, Tante Eula Marie, still lived in the Sachsenhausen section of Frankfurt, in the Kotkis family home, a tiny old house that Riel so loved. Gertrude thought of the magnificent Romer and the Christkindlmarkt. Would Frankfurt be all right? Would all the people there stay safe? Would this nightmare never end? Gertrude's father, made it a point to voluntarily surrender in uniform, with honor, rather than don civilian clothes to escape the consequences of service to the Reich, as had so many others. Hans went on to spend the spring and summer of 1945 as a prisoner of the Allies. After having been subjected to years of Nazi propaganda about the murderous enemy, his diary entry of May 5th, 1945 states, I must admit that up to this point, my impression of the English, but especially of the Americans, is a most favorable one. Of the U.S. soldiers, he said, the guards, the enlisted men, as well as their officers, make an excellent impression. Slim, athletic figures, open, friendly faces, fine postures and good manners. Three days later, he wrote, the English are very hostile towards us, stirred up by reports of unspeakable horrors in the concentration camps where the inmates were apparently slowly starved and tortured to death. If this is really true, the SS has done a horrendous thing. This same day, he added, there is great anger amongst our people with the German government for having pushed resistance past all limits, for having sacrificed hundreds and thousands of people, and for permitting our cities to be destroyed in the full knowledge that the situation was hopeless. Hans was released to return to his family in August 1945. Ultimately, he would begin a new career with the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, NATO, where he worked until his death in 1963. Gertrude Siepmann fled Epstein and Frankfurt with her mother and siblings as bombs fell around them and took refuge in Bavaria. Gertrude found employment as a domestic, tended children in an orphanage, and studied costume design. She fell in love from afar with Hollywood star Errol Flynn in the late 1940s, and then, much closer, with American GI Patrick McVicker, who proposed marriage. Gertrude came to America in 1956 and has been known as Trudy McVicker ever since. After settling in Illinois, Trudy contributed to the family's income by creating collector figurines that she sold exclusively through Marshall Field, the Chicago department store. She presented two of the earliest figurines, depicting Don Juan and Queen Margaret from Errol Flynn's 1949 film, Adventures of Don Juan, as a gift to Flynn's daughters. Errol called them exquisite in a return letter. Over the years, 
Trudy has been a friend to many notables, including Earl Conrad, who ghost wrote Flynn's multi-million selling autobiography, My Wicked, Wicked Ways. She collaborated with Flynn biographer Thomas McNulty and with James Stewart biographer Tony Thomas on several projects. She also became a translator, converting the diary of her father from German into English, then translating the original notes of cancer researcher Dr. Georg Springer and printed works for astronomer and UFO investigator J. Allen Hynek, among many other translation projects. That's how it started. Well, too we bad. Walked walk down the street. Squirt, walk funny. Remember? What? We used to walk funny down the street. <laughs> yeah, I remember. Fan over this here, you you, this you told me to walk like that, <laughs> and I did it to make you happy. We had happy. some fun. Oh, it was great. And you told all your friends, look what she can do. Yeah. And you, he were, I was on this side, and you. He was on this side. I was, I was he selling was champagne. And, and you were, that's right. I was selling was champagne. And the, my, the suit I used to wear when we went out. But at the cool house I wore something and else. And then your dad says, so he didn't want me to wear a uniform. So I didn't wear a uniform. But was the other clothes, boom, a big cake. <laughs> and we had a nice, all the girls going boom. <laughs> And there was this real right. sharp guy, and he wanted to be your who competition. Was the, who was the sharp guy? I don't know. I can't remember those things. But sometimes I connect Abe, with certain things. It helps. Mm-hmm. And so, I, God bless America, I got her today so far. Hmm. Good for you. But you got you, the kids, too. And that'll be nice.